Man, I tell you what, Carl's gone one Sunday and we start playing Boys to Men videos in church. <laughs> well, um, obviously I'm not Carl. And uh, the reason that I'm not Carl, well, there are many, but the main reason that Carl's not up here this morning is that he's not feeling well. He actually got pretty sick on Friday, got worse on Saturday. And so less than 24 hours ago, well, a little over 24 hours ago, uh, the decision was made that uh, I was going to go ahead and deliver the message this morning. So I'm not saying it's not going to be good. (laughs) I'm just saying I didn't have a lot of prep time. (laughs) <laughs> That's all I'm saying. So um, that video will make a lot of sense in a minute. Uh, but for now, I just want to ask a couple questions. First, um, we have like a week left in January, maybe a little less. How many people are still going strong on their New Year's resolutions? Wow. <laughs> That's way less than I thought. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> how many have given up completely on making New Year's resolutions at all? There we go. Okay, those are my people right there. And then, how many of you, sorry, how many of you still write 2018 on everything? Yeah, those are also my people. I do that too. Um, So according to research by the University of Scranton, um, not Scranton in the office, actual Scranton. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, office fans. Uh, By the end of the year, about 92% of people that made New Year's resolutions have quit. So, not a great track record with that. And in my own life, I know that I really am not that great at keeping resolutions either. Um, Dan's little comment about, I shouldn't have eaten that, that really spoke to my heart this morning, (laughs) for sure. But I I do have some thoughts on maybe why resolutions don't stick that much. Um, But first, I just wanted to kind of share a story of the last New Year's resolutions I ever made, or New Year's resolution I ever made. And in fact, it might be the only one I've ever kept. Um, So I was raised by a single dad. Um, My parents got divorced when I was about six. And my dad was an immigrant to to this country. Um, He moved here from Peru shortly after he graduated college. And he was one of those ambitious guys that wanted to come to the land of opportunity. And he came here knowing no one, having no connections, uh, you know, with like a bag of oranges and 20 bucks is one of those stories. And um, that ambition, that that, uh, view, that outlook on opportunity and possibilities is one that I carried with me as I grew up. Um, My dad kind of raised me in church as long as I can remember, you know, student ministry, children's ministry, student ministry. And then... uh, when I got into my teens, I kind of started to question whether I actually believed in God because I believed in God or because I had a relationship with God or if it was just because my dad had taught me and raised me to be that way. And so I really started to question, is this really my faith? Is this really how I want to live or is this just how I've been taught to live? So in that questioning, um, I started to see if I could formulate my own path and, and, and create my own system of beliefs. And, and I, I really just kind of felt like the Bible was just a bunch of rules that I had to follow and a, and a certain way that I had to live, like God was putting me in the box. And, and uh, I just, as a creative kind of person, I just didn't care for that. I thought, you know what, I want to be free. I want to do what I want to do, live how I want to live. So as I coasted through high school, I was kind of an idiot. And uh, now I don't, mean to say that I wasn't intelligent. I was actually kind of a smart kid, but I didn't always make good decisions. And um, I I became more and more arrogant as I thought that I had more and more of life figured out. And I started to discover uh, skills and gifts that I had that I could use to my advantage. And those things made me even more arrogant. I also talked a lot. Like, I mean a lot, a lot. Like, I can't even believe that I used to be that guy. I wouldn't even want to be friends with that guy or know that guy, but unfortunately, I was that guy. And so I just talked a lot, and I think I made a lot of uh, enemies that way. <laughs> but it wasn't long before I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Once I had this, you know, the, the bounds came off and I wasn't living under those constraints anymore, I kind of formulated my plan for my life. And I was going to be a rock star. I was going to be famous. I was going to be on TV, I was going to win a Grammy, and uh, so I wanted to be in a band, or solo, either way, I just, I just had to be famous, and I had to be a big deal. In fact, um, the senior quote underneath my picture in the yearbook, 
says, hang on to my autograph, it'll be worth money when I'm famous. <laughs> I really wish I was kidding, but I have the yearbook and it's in there. So I finally graduated and then I could finally go after my dreams with everything I had. And uh, so I had a friend named Rico. And that's kind of how every interesting story starts, right? With a guy named Rico. <laughs> and so Rico and I got together and we're like, man, we could, we could form a band and we could, we could uh, you know, be big and be huge. Now, Rico couldn't sing at all, really. I mean, he could kind of carry a tune, but he wasn't like a singer, I wouldn't say. But he was a looker. So we're like, okay, we got the looker and we got the singer. Now we just need to find whatever the other things are in a boy band. Because, you know, in the 90s or, you know, almost 2000s, you had limited options if you didn't play instruments. So we were kind of like, I guess we have to start a boy band. That's kind of a big thing right now. So let's do that. So I think we have, yeah, we have some photos. Uh, that's Rico there in the middle. And then that's me all the way on the left. And um, yeah, I mean, we were just too cool for school for sure. And uh, I think we have one more picture, yeah. So, and I don't know why these look like they're from the 60s. It's, <laughs> we had like cameras back then. I don't know what happened. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and that, that video that played uh, at the beginning of the sermon part, that, uh, that was us. I have no idea what we were doing. Like, it looks like we were in a park, just standing there in tuxedos. I don't, I mean, you know, it was boy band stuff. You didn't really have to explain. Um, <laughs> And I'm pretty sure we destroyed that video, right? No one can watch that ever again? Cool. Just making sure. Um, but, you know, what we did is, is we didn't really know anybody. We had no connections. So we would go to um, concerts. If anybody came into town, it didn't matter who it was, we would come into town. We even went to a Ricky Martin concert one time. I mean, we didn't care. So we, we would talk our way backstage, basically. And... Um, you know, we had like the whole, you know, we had Rico, so we could pretty much get in anywhere. And uh, so we would, we would pitch ourselves as the next big thing. And we'd go backstage, we'd talk to managers, or we wouldn't talk to the artists really. Um, we would talk to like managers or producers or agents or the, the people who, who had the connections and could get us somewhere. And in a short amount of time, we were able to do um, what took, takes a lot of people years to do, which is uh, we were able to hook up with the right people, and uh, we actually signed a record deal. Now, our band was called First Class, with a K, of course. Um, and as there often is in bands like this, especially boy bands, I guess, uh, there was some drama, and, and most of it revolved around girls. And so the, the band kind of dissolved a um, little, a little bit after we really got some traction, um, but somehow I guess you know I don't know if we had, like if we went to like uh, boy band meetings or something. But we, I knew of this other boy band that <laughs> that was trying to do the same thing we were here in St. Louis, and so uh, they needed a lead singer, so I kind of jumped on on board with them, and uh, so then um, that's when we that's when we uh, picked up with Capitol Records and. Um, so we were practicing, writing, uh, learning stuff, and coincidentally, uh, I think at, at one point there were like six guys in the band, at another point there were four, and I was the only one that needed dance lessons. Um, so I'm, I'm a little upset about that, but, but it's okay. You know, I, I have it to this day when I go to a wedding, I can just kind of break that out and everybody goes, what, where'd you get those moves? You know, well, you know, somebody paid for them a long time ago. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we, we, we worked really hard. You know, we were in the studio 16 hours a day. Um, we were writing and we were working out. We were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, but we also played pretty hard. The, we, we had cash to go shopping all the time, buy a bunch of clothes, and uh, ate at really expensive restaurants and had a stretch Hummer limo everywhere we went. It was, it was literally everything that I thought I wanted. It was all of my dreams come true. And yet, the whole time, I just felt really empty, and I felt really, um, I didn't feel free. In fact, if anything, I felt like I was trapped. I felt like I had, I had backed myself into a corner, and I had nowhere to go. And uh, the more fame that I tasted, the less I liked it. It just, it all felt really fabricated to me, uh, that we would go travel places, and um, I mean, it's not like I was bringing anything of any value, I was literally just entertaining people, you know, singing songs that, that they don't know and doing, and just kind of saying, look at me, look how great I am. And then people will go, yeah, you're great. And I was like, what? That makes no sense. 
So it just kind of felt, made me feel like a, a bit of a fraud. And at the same time, I, I began to feel a, t- a familiar tug on my heart that, um, you know, kind of brought me back to, to how I was raised a little bit. So in the middle of all this stuff going on with the band, we were, we were doing like a mini tour. We had the, the album that we had written and recorded, and we were actually about to go on tour with Nelly, and then we were going to um, release a single and go on TV and stuff. I mean, it was all just ready to launch. And I, I went and tried out for the worship team at the church where I grew up. And I think at the time, my thinking was just that, um, if I'm going to go out here living like a moron and, and doing heathen stuff, then at least I'd feel a little bit better if I was at least connected at a church somehow. And so that was kind of my rationale. And um, so I did that. And, uh, man, I don't know how, but the leaders of that church saw past all the earrings and the hair wax and the really weird outfits. And, and they saw the, the lost, broken kid inside, and they gave me a chance. And they taught me things. They taught me how to be more humble. They taught me how to um, use the gifts that I had for Christ instead of for myself and how to point my singing towards Christ instead of myself. And uh, they even brought me, they even actually purchased appropriate clothing for me to wear. Uh, I went like, I remember one Christmas I showed up and the worship director at the time was like, oh no, honey, you can't wear that. And so she went to Kohl's down the street and bought me a shirt. I was like, what's wrong with velour? I don't understand. So I actually still have that suit. It's a baby blue velour suit. Um, so I, and during this time, there was a transition that happened. I slowly lost interest in, in the band and the songs that we were singing, the, the tour and all that, and, and the fame. And, and I mean, even the money that I was making, just kind of, I lost interest in it. Just, it wasn't worth the price that I was paying. And so um, our producers and managers started to catch on. They started to kind of feel like, man, you're not really here. You're not really on board. And so I was honest with them and I said, yeah my heart's just not in this anymore. Like, it's just, I just don't feel like this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And this is where I'm pretty sure God stepped in because their, their response was just, okay, we'll just rip up your contract and all the money we've spent on you is non-recoupable, which means you don't owe it back. And um, we'll find somebody else. You're good to go. <laughs> that doesn't happen. I mean, th- this, these are people who've invested a lot of money. They've invested a lot of time and um, they've invested that money thinking that we were going to get it back for them. And for them to just let me walk away like that was definitely a God thing. Uh, famous, famous comedian and actor Jim Carrey also found that the road to fame and riches isn't the way to fulfillment. Um, he once said in an interview, I think that everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. It was January 1st, 2003, when I woke up in the living room of that condo in Creve Core, provided by the label, hungover from a night of partying, and I looked around the room and decided that wasn't the life I wanted to live anymore. Um, I spent the next nine months just really trying to rebuild my life and, and, and who I was, and um, I, I was reading the Bible as often as I could. I even upped my involvement at the church even more. And I began to look for a new group of friends because when you no longer have the money and the fame and the stretch limo and the condo and all that, and I guess the velour suits, I don't really know what drew people in, but um, when you don't have that stuff anymore, you you figure out real quick who your friends are. And so um, it was kind of a lonely time, but it was a good time where I was able to really press into who God wanted me to be and and what he was showing me at that time. And um, then he did probably the coolest thing he's ever done for me. Um, I was at a friend's house, and this beautiful girl walked in. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not like the most eloquent person on earth, but I feel like I'm okay at speaking. And I literally forgot how to speak English. When Amanda walked in the room, I just sat there, and it was, it was a solid 12 to 15 seconds of just mouth hanging open, no words, staring. And my buddy, whose house we were at, finally goes, dude, stop drooling and tell her your name. So I really appreciate him. And uh, 
I, I did, and we had a somewhat coherent conversation. And then when she left, I turned to that same buddy, and after scolding him a little bit, I, I said, dude, I think I just met my wife. I mean, I knew right away that, that Amanda was going to change my life, for sure. But what I didn't know um, was about the incredible family that, that would come with her into my life. Um, most people have a complicated relationship with their in-laws. I'm not going to say mine's simple, but what I will say is that I, I really don't know where I would be if God hadn't brought them into my life. I mean, they, they, um, they helped me in every possible way to, to really work through the journey to become who, who God called me to be. And they provided uh, guidance, a godly example. They opened their home to me. They helped me financially. They even showed me what it looks like when a, a whole family sticks together and supports each other through thick and thin. So through that, um, I began to step into to the life that I believe that God created me to live, and I began to use what he had given me for his purposes instead of my own. So I think that's the key. I don't think we're all supposed to do the same thing. I, I think we're all called to do different things, and I think we're all created differently. Um, we're, all, we're not all supposed to be in boy bands and wear blue velour suits. Actually, I don't think anyone is, as a matter of fact, on that one. But, but I do think that we all have a longing for belonging. Am I right? I mean, we all want to be, we all want to feel like we're a part of something that matters and a part of something that, that's bigger than what we could have done on our own. We have that desire. And I think maybe that's why I chased fame at such an early age that I, I felt like, you know, and kid, I mean, what do kids dream about? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. I mean, those are things that just seem like they're really bigger than the average guy, right? That they're doing bigger things. But I think that God has called us all to the same purpose in its, at its core, and that's, that's just to worship, to worship Him. Now, before you all pass out from shock, because the worship guy thinks that our purpose in life is to worship, I know that might be crazy. I'm not just talking about musical worship, obviously. I'm talking about a life of worship. I'm talking about a life that reflects the glory of God and who He is and why He's deserving of such praise. So, um, in my case, in order to, to get that life of worship, in order to kind of turn my, my direction in that way, um, I had to do a, whole, a wholesale change. I mean, I had to change my social circle, um, new address. I had to um, basically liquidate any and all financial stability I had accrued up to that point and start over. But, um, you know, I bet, I bet that that's not really necessary for everybody in this room. To, to live a life of worship if you're not already. It's a heart change at the core. The step one, the final step, and everything in between happens at the heart level. So my heart had taken me somewhere that required kind of a drastic change. But I bet most of us in this room could just refocus our hearts. We could go home to the same house in the same car, and tomorrow morning we could wake up and go to the same job and talk to the same people that we worked with last week and just make a heart change and, and make a big difference. So to be honest, though, I am going to talk about music worship a little bit. I mean, that makes sense, right? So when we talk, start talking about the subject of like corporate worship and music, I know some of you kind of get excited and I noticed it happened in the first service too. Some people start like shifting in their seats a little bit. They're like, oh, okay, what are we going to do now? What's this about? I'm not going to do anything weird. Um, we tried to get snakes, but it's like the wrong time of year or something. I don't know. So, um, so here's what I thought we would do. I mean, so let, let's read Psalm 100 together. The psalmist David is, is just talking about a, a great heart posture for worship. So let's just start there. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And that's good stuff. Sounds really great. But, well, like, what does that mean today? What does that mean for us? How can we practically apply that in worship? 
other than it just sounding really great and sounding like, yeah, I want that, but what does that mean? So, um, I know that for some of you, it's, it's natural. To, when you read something like that, something happens inside you, in, in your heart, and it just like flips the worship switch, and you almost just want to stand up and praise and put your hands in the air. And, and for, other, for others of you, your personality may not lend itself to that kind of public expression, and so you might just kind of not really know what to do with that other than to internalize it as scripture and truth, and that's good but it's just a different approach. So to get us all on the same page, I wanted to see if we could shift our perspective just a little bit. Um, I want to ask a serious question. What are your most valuable things? Like what, what stuff means the most to you? Now I'm asking this very specifically so that you can't say stuff like my family or my dog. Even somebody said in the first service, I'm like, well, I guess that's a thing, but it's kind of... But, so what, what's most valuable to you? Go ahead, yell it out, tell me. Pictures, that's great. What was that? Health. Mm, that's kind of an intangible. What about like cars, house? There you go. Uh, for, for me, it would be like music equipment. I've got, you know, some stuff. Maybe my hockey stuff. It's not like... Piano. Piano, there you go. So um, here's an interesting question, though. What if you had something valuable, but you didn't know that it was valuable? I read a quote from a car collector who said, my greatest fear is that when I die, my wife will sell all my car stuff for what I told her I paid for it. (laughs) Actually, in 2007, a New York woman purchased a small white china bowl at a garage sale for $3. She displayed the bowl in her living room for six years before finally becoming curious about its origins. So she did a little research and she thought, hey, this might actually have some history. So they hired a, a, uh, an appraiser to come in and, and take a look at it. And uh, they were then informed that the bowl was over a thousand years old and one of only two like it in the world, the other one being in a British museum. In 2013, the family sold the bowl at auction for $2.2 million. I'm going to say that again. This family walked past an item worth $2.2 million every day for six years, thinking it was worth $3 from a garage sale. See, when you, when you see the value of something, it kind of shifts how you interact with it, doesn't it? I guarantee you they didn't just sit it in their living room anymore. And depending on the thing and the value of that thing and what you do with it, it might actually change the way you live your life. I bet you after scooping up $2.2 million, they maybe even had a different living room, maybe decorated a little different. But the point is, in order to properly prioritize something in our life, we have to see its true value. And that can begin to shape our decisions and our actions. Now we're talking about the things that really matter. We're talking about our family, our relationships, calling on our lives, our career, our health, maybe our faith. I mean, I would hope we would all agree that a relationship with the creator of the universe is important. Jesus in Matthew 6.21 said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that tells us whatever we treasure is ultimately what will captivate our attention and our time and our love and our worship. It will dictate our actions and decisions. It will shape us. So what and how we worship is important. It's very important. But worship is is important for another reason. It it teaches us who God is. When we sing songs of of proclamation, when we say uh, those, when we sing those lines that talk about how great God is and how amazing God is, and it's it's affirmation of who He is, and it and it speaks to our hearts to let us know who He is. So that's another important part of our growth in Christ. Um. Now I'm going to try another thing, and this might be equally weird to some, but uh, what, what do you love about Jesus? Go ahead and tell me. What, what's, what's your favorite thing about Jesus, or just anything you love about Jesus? Grace. Grace. The fact that he loves you, definitely. What he did for you. What was that? Acceptance, yeah. So really all of those answers boil down to one thing, is that he's everything. That he's everything we need him to be and more. Is that 
He is the perfect picture of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and acceptance and just all of those things that we can say. He's the perfect image of God, but he knows what it's like to be human. He knows what struggles that we would go through. He shows us who God is with his life and and how he lived it. And uh, his grace and mercies are new every day. That's great news for a sinner like me. But do we treasure that? Do we treasure him? Do we, do we properly value that? So I read a, a story uh, by a writer named Robert Fulgham. And in this story, he just describes a treasure of his. Uh, the, this, is, this is what he says. The cardboard boxes mark the good stuff. The box contains those odds and ends of personal treasures that have survived many bouts of clean it out and throw it away that seize me from time to time. A thief looking into the box wouldn't take anything, but if the house ever caught on fire, that box goes with me. One of the keepsakes in the box is a paper bag. Lunch-sized, though the top is sealed with duct tape, staples, and several paper clips, there's a ragged rip in one side through which the contents can be seen. This particular lunch sack has been in my care for maybe 14 years, but it really belongs to my daughter Molly. Soon after she became of school age, she became an enthusiastic participant in packing lunches for herself, her brothers, and me. Each bag got a share of sandwiches, apples, milk money, and sometimes a note or a treat. One morning, Molly handed me two bags, one regular lunch sack, and then the other with the duct tape and staples and paper clips. I asked, why two bags? Well, the other one is something else. Well, what's in it? Oh, just some stuff. Take it with you. So I stuffed both sacks into my briefcase, kissed the child, and rushed off. At midday, while hurriedly scarfing down my real lunch, I tore open Molly's bag and shook out the contents. Two hair ribbons, three small stones, a plastic dinosaur, a pencil stub, a tiny seashell, two animal crackers, a marble, a used lipstick, a small doll, two chocolate kisses, and 13 pennies. I smiled. How cute. Rising to hustle off, I swept the desk clean into the wastebasket. Leftover lunch, Molly's junk and all. There wasn't anything there that I needed. That evening, Molly came to stand beside me while I was reading the paper. Where's my bag? What bag? You know, the one that I gave you this morning. Oh, I left it at the office. Why? Well, I forgot to put this note in it. And she handed over the note. Besides, I want it back. Why? Well, those are my things in the sack, Daddy, the ones I really like. I thought you might want to play with them, but now I want them back. You didn't lose the bag, did you, Daddy? Tears puddled up in her eyes. Oh, no, no, I I just forgot to bring it home, I lied. I'll bring it home tomorrow, okay? She hugged my neck with relief, unfolded the note that had not gotten into the sack, and it read, I love you, Daddy. Oh, and uh (laughs) uh-oh. I looked long at the face of my child. Molly had given me her treasures. All that a seven-year-old held dear, love in a paper sack, and I had missed it. Not only had I missed it, but I had thrown it away because there wasn't anything there that I needed. It was the first time, it wasn't the first time or the last time I felt my daddy permit was about to be revoked. It was a long trip back to the office. And as I'm searching through the trash can, a janitor came in to do his chores. He asked, did you lose something? I said, yes, my mind. He said, well, it's probably in there, all right. What does it look like? I'll help you find it. I started to not tell him, but then I realized I couldn't look like any more of a fool than I was. So I told him. Well, he didn't laugh. He just said, oh, I've got kids too. So the Brotherhood of Fools searched through the trash and found the jewels. And he smiled at me and I smiled at him. I returned the bag to Molly. No questions asked, no explanations offered. And after dinner, I asked her to tell me about the stuff in the sack. So she took out a piece at a time and placed the object on a row on the dining room table. Everything had a story or a memory. And I managed to say, oh, I see, wisely very time, uh, several times. And as a matter of fact, I did see. Molly gave me the bag once again several days later. Same ratty bag, same stuff inside. I felt forgiven and trusted and loved. It was never clear to me why I did or did not get the bag on any given day. But in time, Molly returned her attention to other things, found other treasures, and lost interest in the game. She grew up. Me, I was left holding the bag. She gave it to me one morning and never asked for its return. So I have it still. The worn paper sack is there in the box, left over from a time when a child said, Here, this is the best I've got. Take it. It's yours. So here's the point. 
Each of us has a bag. And we've got stuff in it that we find valuable to, ourself, to, to us. And absolutely from where God's sitting, he could, he could look at that collection of things that we hold valuable and throw it all in the trash. Nothing there he needs. But the truth is, when we bring what's valuable and we lay it down to him and we say, this is the best I've got. This is everything that I am. Everything that I hold dear and valuable, it's, it's yours. And we, and we lift that up to him. He sees the value in that. And it, and it warms his heart. Probably like a story like that warms the heart of every parent in this room. Jesus, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I read a cartoon that read, the preacher said we should get just as excited at church as we do when watching the Super Bowl. So after he preached a good sermon, we poured Gatorade on his head. <laughs> now, I'm not really that into football. Um, but if anybody feels like pouring Gatorade on somebody's head after the service today, I would like to point out that Dan did a great job. That's all I'm going to say. No, please don't pour Gatorade on Dan's head. That would be, that would be horrible. But still, there, there's, there's something contagious about that kind of passion, that kind of excitement, right? I mean, people go crazy at sporting events, and even, even in your own home. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say... I do this, but some people might like yell at the TV and stuff when the blues aren't playing well. I mean, again, not me, but some people might. Or, you know, watching the current Super Bowl, I don't know that there's a whole lot of passion here in St. Louis with that. But the point is, we should be just as passionate at church as we are doing other things that are passionate uh, in our lives like that. Because passion is contagious. That kind of passion is contagious. So if, imagine if every Sunday, every church in America was full of people passionately wrapped up in worship. Imagine if that passion and excitement would spill over into the everyday lives. And imagine if the powerful message, message of the gospel was preached constantly by people all over the country who lived their life with conviction and intensity. I think there would be far fewer people lost in America. And in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, um, it's, a, it's a long passage and I won't read the whole thing. But the beginning says, The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. So I just want to stop there because that, that part just jumps out to me. When they saw him, they worshipped. And I think that should be the natural response. When we get a glimpse of who Jesus is, when we get a glimpse of who God really is, I think the natural response is just to worship. And again, in my mind as a worship guy, when I read that passage, the picture in my mind, when they saw him, they worshiped. I'm thinking they busted out a guitar and started singing some Chris Tomlin, right? But that's not, that's, that's super impractical. That's not what happened. When they saw him, they worshiped. I mean, that looked like something. I don't know what it looked like. It doesn't say here. But I guarantee you it was a heart posture, that when they saw him, they were in awe. They were in wonder. And that created a physical response, an emotional response, and a response that uses all of the senses and all the things that we're built with. And trust me, I get it. Not everybody's going to be passionate about every song we do here. And not every song is going to move you to tears or to lift your hands in the air. But let's just say for a moment that we all leave here with our li and live our lives full of worship and everything we do points to the glory of God. And to be clear, that's the goal, right? I mean, that would be the goal for all of us. So imagine that lost person that you've been trying to reach finally sees that you're living life a little differently than they are and suddenly they want what you have. So now they come to church. And for the first 20 minutes of the service, you're standing there with your hands in your pockets like you're in line at the DMV. Now... I'm not saying everybody needs to be jumping up and down or that even everybody should really be singing particularly loud. The Bible does say make a joyful noise, but I think it's possible we would define joyful a little differently from, from person to person. But the bottom line is we should all be engaged to some capacity when we're worshiping together. And that could look different for everyone. Maybe you sit, maybe you kneel, maybe you do dance. Maybe you just close your eyes and begin to thank the Lord for what he's done in your life. But I promise you, it's a powerful thing when we're in a room filled with people who are engaged and connected to the living power of the living God. Worship is a powerful witnessing tool too. When we lift up, glorify, and worship Jesus, it displays who he is. 
and why he's worthy of our praise. And then when other people see that, what do you think their response is going to be? So when we come together to worship, or when we're on our way to work, or we're sitting at home, or out to lunch alone with a friend, God wants us to bring the good stuff. He wants us to bring everything we've got and our best. And he's worthy of all that and a lot more. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful that you give us the opportunity, not only at church, not in a special room, not at a special place or a special time, but you give us 24-hour, seven days a week access to the Holy Spirit and to really to just be in a space with you where we can worship with you, where we can get to know you, where we can hear from you. And God, we're just thankful that you love us the way that you do. Just pray that you'd speak to our hearts and show us those moments where we're maybe not giving you our best, where we're maybe holding on to some things. And also, God, I just pray that as we move forward and as we try to maybe turn our hearts more toward you in a worshipful posture. Pray that you can show us the true value of, of that time with you and show us, the, show us the fullness of life that you really want to bring about through our lives of worship and the way that we carry that out. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of communion now, and that's a tangible way that we get to Show God gratitude and remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. If you're a believer in Christ, we encourage you to participate along with us during this part. Uh, the ushers are going to come forward and pass out the elements. And you can just take a few minutes there and just kind of um, consider the cost and spend some time uh, in communion, really. And then take the elements whenever you're ready. If if you're not sure what this is about or, or if... Uh, the parts about grace and love and Jesus that we talked about today, if none of that felt familiar to you or if you don't know what that's like, we'd love to talk to you after the service and walk you through that. But for now, let's, uh, let's pray together. God, we're thankful for the sacrifice that was made through Jesus, the body that was broken and the blood that was shed to cover our sins and make us whole. We're thankful for that. We, we don't deserve it and, and yet you, you give it you paid such a high price and you give it away. We're thankful for that. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.